something. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. So turn to your hymn books. There should be a hymn book in front of you. Turn to page 390. Page 390. Have I, have I done my best for Jesus? Let's stand together and sing this wonderful song. I brought the Jerry Lewis into this song. Have I done my best for Jesus? I mean, we got to give Christ our best effort because he gave his best for us. He gave his all. So this is something that we got to be mindful every day, remind ourselves. We don't know when our last day is going to come, and I'll be talking about that in my message. We don't know when you're going to give your last breath. You want to give your best for the Lord. You want to surrender all so you die happy and not a waste of life because all it was done for Christ will last. That's the only thing that matters. The spiritual matters more than the physical in God's eyes. So this son encouraged us to just step it up for Jesus, to go the extra mile for him and to give him our best, our maximum effort in serving him because it's, a, it's, a, it's not a waste of life, it's the best life. And it pays off at the end. Paul said for me to live is Christ and to die it is what? Gain. That's what Paul said, when you live Christ, when you die, it's not lost, it's big gain. So page 390 in your hymn book and let's sing this song, Have I Done My Best for Jesus? As Brother Jerry loves into this song. for 
Jesus when he has done so much for me. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. And this evening in the book of 1 Samuel and looking at chapter 31. Chapter 31 of 1 Samuel. And we'll be looking at all 13 verses of that chapter for our text passage. 1 Samuel chapter 31. So there in the book of 1 Samuel in chapter 31, and starting in verse 1, the word of the Lord reads, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, and Abinadab, and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor-bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through, and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Amen. Please be seated. All right. We're going to test and pick up what we left off last Wednesday. First Samuel chapter 31. I'm going to hit every verse and unpack every verse. And by the way, it is good to see, uh, Joanne and um, Sydney, what a surprise. Good surprise to have them tonight. Remember, I, they got baptized. They followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Her and mom and daughter and, and the niece and the other daughter. And she's here today. I know she has a, a she told me that, uh, uh, you know, her schedule before I even present the gospel to her, that she works Sundays and it's a rough schedule. But some Wednesday she's off and she's here. Praise the Lord. So make sure you greet them. Thank them for coming, Joanne and Sydney. And uh, I know you look familiar back here. You do look familiar. And, uh, 
Okay, good to see you. God bless you. Good to see you. Make sure you give their uh, thank you for coming to. Thank you for being here and everybody else. So, the title of my message uh, tonight is Saul's Sad Ending. Saul's Sad Ending. Let's pray again. Father, make me a blessing. Give me your power. Lord, it's, it's not about me, Lord. I'm not the issue here. I'm only a sinner saved by grace trying to encourage other sinners who are saved by grace to live for God, to put the Lord first, to be committed to the Lord, Lord, to live a fruitful, effective, fruit-bearing life for the Lord Jesus Christ because it's not in vain, Lord. And um, I pray that you will use the message tonight in Spanish and English, empower me and Monsi, and let, let, let the truth come out. Let me put the emphasis where it's needed. Help us to cast something tonight, Lord, so we could be better Christian and better honor you and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to come to the end of, of the life of Saul. Saul was a man who had a good beginning, but a bad ending. He started well, but he ended bad. So, and this is a reminder to us that we can't start well, but we could end bad. You know, we need to have that determination and that all-consuming passion in our heart, it should burn in our heart every day, our goal, that when we reach death, when we reach the finish line, we're going to finish strong. We're going to finish well. And that will be our attitude every single day. That will be your, your target every single day. Because you don't know what tomorrow may bring. You don't know. Today might be my last day here preaching. I want to get my best. I want to meet the Lord faithful. So we don't know. So it's a reminder to us that we could start well but end bad. Saul started in light and ended in darkness. He started in humility but ended in pride. Saul started strong but he ended weak. He started spiritual but he ended carnal. He started victorious and ended defeated. He started his reign as king of Israel, the first king of Israel. He started his reign with courage and then, but ended in fear. He began his career standing, but ended falling. So we need to learn lessons from Saul's life tonight. We need to learn lessons from Saul's failures. The life of Saul was characterized in the Bible by disobedience to God. It started good again, but it didn't end well, and you see the pattern of his life. It was characterized by the Bible, disobedient to God. Carnality, do it my way. Uh, Self-centered. He didn't follow God's will. He wanted to do his own thing. And his life ended tragically, and what a waste of life that was. So he failed to obey the word of God. And can I tell you tonight, I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of obeying God's word. I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of obeying God's word while you're here. That's so important. I preached la last Sunday in the morning and in the, in the evening about be strong and fear not. Be strong and fear not. And it was Joshua. He was fearful, and God had to remind him over and over to be strong and to have courage. And God reminded him, this is your number one priority, uh, uh, Joshua. You're going to face enemies. I gave you the land of Canaan. It's going to be yours. You're going to conquer it. But as soon as you step foot in the territory, you're going to face giants. It's not going to be easy. And he was fearful, and God gave him a promise. This is your number one priority, Joshua, for you to be successful in, in, in conquering the land and defeating your enemy. This is your number one priority, and it's on Joshua chapter 1. Verse 8, where it says this, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate day and night, that thou may observe to do according to that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. That was the number one priority for Joshua in battle. And by the way, that should be our number one priority in our battle, because we are in a spiritual battle. We all face tough times and trials and enemies and in order for us to be successful in our battle and to be victorious and to be courageous, we must make the Word of God the priority. We must obey the Word of God. 
And Saul fell miserably because he disobeyed God's word. So that's a, that, that's a wake up cup for all. Saul, sad death is a reminder to us that not all of us will have a happy death. I hope all, everyone here will have a happy death. Not all of us are going to have a, some will have a sad death like Saul. There's many people that I could tell you that started well. They used to be faithful, like you were, but today they're not. They're living for themselves. They started well, maybe even for years, but today they're defeated, and, 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 and many of them have died a sad death. You know, you ever go to the cemetery and read the tombstones? You ever done that? You know, where you just read the tombstones. I, 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 I done that. Sometimes when I'm in the funeral, I just go around and I find it interesting. I see different ages and d different people, die at different ages and, and, and different years. And, and, you know, I done that. But I read about an old Indiana tombstone that read these words. This was re this true. It was it's, or Indiana. Years ago, there was a tombstone that read like this. It goes like this. Uh, it says, pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. And a pastor passed by and read those words. And underneath, he added a response. He said, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. And... You know, that's a good response. <laughs> that is a good response, right? We want to follow the right kind of examples of Christians who died, faithful, who had a happy ending. We want to follow the example of Christians who knew the Lord Jesus Christ, they were saved. But not only they claimed to be saved, but they lived like saved people. And they knew the Lord in an intimate way, and they served the Lord faithfully all the days of their life, and they died a happy death. They died faithful. That's the example we must follow. That's the example I want to follow. And God has given us many examples, even in our lifetime. Not only we see examples in the Bible, but many examples even in this church. I can't think of a better example than Pastor William Garrick, the one who pastored this church the longest year. What an example he was. He's a good example to follow. And I think of his, of his mom, Mrs. Sue Garrick. She was also another faithful good example. They're, they're in heaven. I mean, I, I think of um, uh, Pastor Horton. A any of you knew Pastor Horton? Pastor Horton was a, was a friend. Oh, you knew Pastor Horton? Right, he, he, he Pastor uh, Central Baptist. Pastor Horton was my friend. He was a fisherman. We fished together with me and Pastor Garrick. And he was 80-something years old when he went to be with the Lord, and he died faithful. He was a good example. It was a happy death. It was a faithful death, not a sad death like Saul. Examples like Brother Thomas. You know, I was, I just mentioned to you before that if you ever go to the cemetery and read Tombstone, but well, I did that Monday at the burial of Gladys Rivera that you guys pray for. And I was there with the family, trying to support the family and bring comfort to the family, encouragement. And, and while they were there uh, uh, trying to, to uh, uh, commend her body to the grave, I was uh, reading Tombstones around me. I was just reading. And you know what? I turned behind me, and guess whose tombstones I read? Brother Thomas. I read Brother Thomas, and it, it says this, April 22, 1926, and he went to be with the Lord December 20, 1997. I said, look, my wife, look at Brother Thomas. And he has a picture of him with a suit on and a tie and, and a faithful man of God, Brother Thomas, a man faithfully serving this church faithfully until he went to be with the Lord. That's the kind of example we need to follow. And like Brother Rick, another example. So the Apostle Paul in the Bible, a great example. Paul that he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my court. I kept the faith. That's the kind of example we need to follow. And you and I need to pray, Lord, help me to end well. That should be your prayer. That should be my prayer. Lord, help me to die faithful and to finish the race happy and well, pleasing to your side, putting you first. That should be our prayer. We need to run 
with patience the race that is set before us. Just like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 tells us, because the Christian life is a long distance of race. A race. That's what the Bible calls the Christian life. And it's a race, and we need to, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 1, that we are Christian, need to, with patience, run the race that is set before us. How? Verse 2, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's our inspiration that will help us to keep going faithfully, like he was. Amen? We need to pray like David in Psalm 51, verse 10. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We need to pray, Lord, keep me humble and dependent upon you. Lord, help me to keep relying on you until I give my last breath. Because a lot of people start off well, but they don't end well. We see a good example here of Saul. He started well, but he did not end well. So this is, we could learn some lessons from Paul's uh, uh, life. Let's see this, the sad ending of the life of Saul, and let's draw some important lessons from his life. Because of his pride, because of his disobedience, Saul lost everything. He lost everything. And we're going to look at some losses in the life of Saul because of pride and because of disobedience. And we're going to look, we're going to look at four. I'm going to give you four losses in this chapter. That Saul lost because of pride, the sin of pride, and the sin of disobedience. First, we see that Saul loses his army. He loses his army. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1. If you got your Bible in front of you, sometimes we put Bibles in the pew. You could use them. They're free for you to use, so you could follow along with the Bible. Not just listen. 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1. The first thing that Paul lost, I mean that Saul lost, was his army. 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled. So now we see that the war breaks out between these two. It's a hot war right here. And it says here that the men of Israel fled from the Philistine and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Now this is sad, that the men of Israel fled from before the Philistine and fell down slain into Mount Gilboa. So we see here that Israel's leaders have turned away from God and led to their defeat against their enemies, and now they are destroyed. They are destroyed. Can I tell you tonight, the same thing could happen to us? The same thing could happen to us when we turn away from God and we turn away from his word. It will lead us to defeat and destruction of our life. You know what Jesus says in John chapter, uh, what is it, 15, the fruit-bearing uh, chapter? For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus says, without me, you are a big zero with all capital letters. You're going nowhere. We need his help to fight our enemies. He, the Bible tells us in the, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament over and over, the Lord will fight your battles. Amen? He never lost a fight. We want God on our side. We want to make sure that we're obedient to his word. And we're pleasing so God can fight our enemies. What happened to, this, to, the, to, the, uh, to Saul and his man? Saul lost his army because they turned their back on God. They, they dishonored, they displeased the Lord, and they were on their own. It was not their army that gave them victory. It was the God uh, uh, that guided their army. The, 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 the power of Almighty God. He's the one that could give us victory over our enemies, but the leaders have turned away from God and led to their defeat, and now they're destroyed. Again, that could happen to us when we turn our back on God and His Word. It will lead to defeat and destruction of our life. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 13, whoso despise the Word shall be destroyed. You despise God's Word, you're going to be destroyed just like Saul. You had to get a hold of that verse. Proverbs chapter 13, the book of wisdom, verse 13. Whoso despises the word shall be destroyed. You're going to be destroyed if you neglect this book. You take this book lightly. You turn your back on God. You want to do it your own way. It's, you're not going to have a good path. In 1 Timothy, I'm going to give you an example. 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 18 to 20. Paul gives Timothy a charge 
In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, he says, This charge, I'm reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. What is the prophecy? According to the scriptures, the inspired word of God. We need to live by the scriptures. The scriptures inspire us to stay faithful and to put the Lord first and to obey God and to obey the word and God promise you victory over your enemies. And it says here, he tell him this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by then, I'm talking about the scriptures, mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So the idea here of the shipwrecked faith of these two men, Hymenius and Alexander, there in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19, that idea of, of their shipwrecked faith is that they have gotten away from good teaching and drifted into the dangerous rocks of false teaching. So they have wrecked their faith. And you know, it's interesting that Paul clearly links faith with a good conscience and a righteous behavior that comes with a good conscience. So Hymenius and Alexander have put away a good conscience that comes by good teaching of the Word of God, a proper belief in the Word of God. In other words, they love their sin more than God's true, and they wreck their faith. And by the way, it will happen to you also. You go ahead and depart from the truth, and you love your sin more than the truth, guess what? You're heading for destruction. Shipwreck faith. So having put away, having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, it means to get away from good teaching. It means to depart from the truth of God and drift into dangerous rocks of false teaching. So those who accept false teachings and ignore their conscience will suffer spiritual damage like a ship that hits rocks and is broken up in pieces. That's exactly what happened to Saul. Shipwreck. Destroy. Why? Because he allowed it. It didn't have to be that way. God had a better plan for his life. He just needed to be obedient to God and take God at his word. So he lost. So we see here that Saul suffered great losses because of his pride and his, his disobedience to God. First, he lost his army. That means that the, the God who protected him, God at one time was guarding Saul's army, and they got victory after victory. He started well, but now he turned his back on God. Now God removed his hand of protection, and Saul, because of that, lost his army. And so you and I. So you and I. You better, you better take God's word serious, Christian. You better obey the Lord and swallow your pride. Humble yourself. Because these are examples for us. You came here to hear this. Amen? So he lost first his army. Number two, he lost his sons. This is a tough one. He lost his sons. It's sad that our sin does affect others. Our sin does, you better think about it before you play with sin because not only is it going to affect you, not only are you going to face severe consequences for your sin, but it's going to affect others. You don't sin alone. You don't sin by yourself. You affect others. And so sin affected others, especially his children, his sons. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14 in verse 7, it says, for none of us live it to himself, and no man died to himself. In other words, the focus of our Christian living is never for yourself. Everything we do is living for God, not for yourself. Everything we do is to please the Lord, to bring honor and glory to his name, not to live for ourselves, not to bring attention to ourselves like Saul did. The point that Paul is giving us here in Romans chapter 14 in verse 7 when he says, for none of us live to himself, and no man dying to himself, the point that Paul is bringing here is what we do, in fact, influence others around us. And that influence can be destructive. It could be constructive, or it could be destructive. And we got to build others with our good influence, a good godly example, a good godly influence. We're supposed to build people up, not destroy them. Our sins 
does affect others, especially for us as parents. Our sins will affect our children. You know, I, I, I say this. I heard this years ago when I was in college. You treat, you, 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 you know, the young people. I tell them, young people, treat your parents the way, treat your parents the, the way you want your children to treat you one day when you have children. Amen? Treat your parents the way you want to be treated, with, with, with the way you want your children to treat you. 1 Samuel chapter 31, look at it, verse 1, just to show you that he lost his son because his sin affected his children. 1 Samuel 31, verse 2, And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinabah and Malshushua, Saul's son. Now this is a sad ending for the life of Jonathan. Jonathan was our hero. We read about that hero, that great man of faith. David's loyal friend. He didn't support his dad's sin. You know, he, 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 he was a hero of the faith, a mighty warrior for God. And he lost his life here. Very sad. We see here that Saul lost his army. He lost his sons. But then, number three, he lost his life. He lost his life. Notice in verse 3 there, 1 Samuel chapter 31. Notice in verse 3, it says, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. So Saul was hit by the arrows of the Philistines. It's interesting to me that Saul had been trying for years to get the Philistines to kill David, but in the end, the Philistines actually killed Saul. Hey, you heard, you heard this, this saying, the chickens always come home to roost. We heard that, right? Hey, you know what that means? You reap what you sow. Amen? You reap what you sow. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, in verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever men sow, that shall he also reap. You reap what you sow. That Lord of sowing and reaping, it never fails. It never fails. Sin will catch up to you. Sin will affect others. And by the way, you better, you better be a good example because your children might, might follow your same sins, even worse. 1 Samuel 31, verse 4, Then says Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and trust me through therewith, lest this uncircumcised come and trust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer will not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword, and fell upon it. So he asks his armor bearer, he says, look, just kill me. Just kill me. He says, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that to God's anointed. You're the king. I'm not going to do that. And he didn't do it. And the Bible said that Saul, right there in the verse 4, the end, a very sad statement. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. That is the sad end of Saul's life. This actually shows us how Saul died. He committed suicide. That's a sad end. Isn't that sad when you hear that somebody commits suicide? That is a sad end. That's very heartbreaking. Saul took a sword and fell upon it. He didn't want to, to fall alive in the hands of the Philistines. He didn't want to be tortured by them. So he asked the armor bearer, put the sword on me, kill me. He said, I'm not going to do that. So he killed himself because he didn't want to fall in the hands of the Philistines. And he didn't want to be, be tortured by, by, by the enemies. Verse 5. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Here's another man who committed suicide. Two men committed suicide. You see how Saul's sin is affecting others? Your sin will affect others. Verse, verse 6. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same they together. This is a very sad ending. The first king of Israel is dead. Saul is dead. His three children, three sons are dead. That's sad. Think about it. The king of the first king of Israel is dead. Saul. You know what Saul means? Saul means as of God. That's what Saul means, as of God. And remember that the people of God cried out to God, We want a king. 
and they asked God for a human king. And God gave them King Saul. God gave them King Saul, and King Saul, and, and, and God gave them King Saul, and King Saul lived in pride and disobedient. And then he took his own life by suicide. It was a sad death. It was a shameful death. But Christian, it did not happen. It, it did not have to happen this way. That could have been avoided. God had a better plan for his life, but he failed to live his life according to God's plan, and he paid a terrible price. It didn't have to be that way. God had a better plan. He could have died a faithful, happy death if he just obeyed God's plan and God's will for his life. Sadly, we see the same thing happen to people all around us. God desires to save them. He wants to set them free. Jesus wants to save them. Jesus wants to give them a new life and change their life and bless them and use them for his glory. And people, however, refuse to go God's way and they live lives of defeat and ultimately they die those tragic deaths. It doesn't have to be that way. Just in the Dominican parade here, I'm hearing that there was a, some violence there. People fighting each other. And I, ha I have two policemen came on my house yesterday watching the cameras on the, on the thing, looking for, for those, those, those guys, those criminals, stabbing people and, and trying to kill people. And, you know, these people need the Lord. They're going to die and go to hell without Christ. But they have no fear of God. They don't want God. Many times we try to witness to them. They don't want to hear it. And they're... They're, they're dying tragic death, suicide, or, 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 or violence. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus wants to give you a real life, satisfying life, a real life that is worth living. He wants to give you the abundant life. But the devil wants to steal the life from you. He wants to destroy the blessings of God in your life. He wants to deceive you. He wants you to follow the devil, follow sin. And you know what happened? The devil never keeps his promises. The devil is a liar. He's deceiving you. He's going to hell, and he wants to take as many people to hell with him. And he wants you to die a death of a tragic death of, of defeat. He wants you to die a death where you just don't even know God. We, we either have the ministry of a thief or the ministry of a good shepherd, Jesus Christ, in our life. I had the devil. I, look, we were all children of the devil before Christ. All of us were. According to John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, you are, you, you are of your father, the devil, talking to all saved people. And, um, you know, the, I, the, the devil, he's a thief. He deceived me. He stole everything that God had for me prepared. Thank God, now I have the good shepherd. Now I have the ministry of a shepherd, not the ministry of a thief deceiving me. Amen? Saul's death, listen, Saul's death serves as a clear reminder that death is coming for all of us. Think about it. In the battlefield, Saul died. His three sons died. The armor bearer died. And many of the men of his army died. Many died. You know what that tells us? That's a reminder. Saul is coming. Death is coming to every one of us. Rich or poor. It doesn't matter. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. That means you have an appointment with death. Today, me and my wife, we cancel an appointment uh, with the doctor because it was, uh, I wanted to get a physical, and I told her to cancel for another two weeks, amen? We could do that, right? Can't do that with death. And we don't know when that appointment is. God has it in his calendar. It could happen any time. You better make sure that you prepare to meet your God. Just like the book of Amos tells us. The Bible tells us in Job chapter 30 and verse 23. For I know that thou will bring me to death. Psalm 89 verse 48. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the great? Selah. We can either die badly like Saul or we could die well. I don't know about you, but I want to die well. I don't want to die bad, a bad death. I want to die well. 
You know that even God does not desire a sinner to die a bad death. God doesn't want that. That's not God's plan. Even God doesn't desire that. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be committed to him. God wants you to put him first. He wants to bless you in this life. So when you die, before you will be tremendous gain. Even God himself does not want the sinner to die a bad death. I don't think God was pleased the way Saul died. And the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Even God himself don't want the rebellious person to die in his sin or her sin and die a bad death. God wants you to repent and turn from your ways and turn to Christ. Let him save you. Let him change you. Start living for him. It's the best life. So Saul, I said number one, Saul lost his army. Number two, Saul lost his sons. Number three, Saul lost his life. Number four, Saul lost his honor. He lost his honor. He lost his reputation. He lost his crown. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 31. Look at verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 7. It says, And the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side of Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook their cities and fled, and the Philistine came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on tomorrow when the Philistine came to strip the slain, that they found Saul, this is sad, they found Saul and his three sons falling in Mount Gilboa. And watch what happened. Saul lost his honor, his respect, his reputation, even his crown. Look, and they cut off his head. This is the enemy. Then strip off his armor and send it into the land of the Philistine round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtoreth, and they fastened his body into the wall of Basham. That's horrible for that to happen to the king. What a, he lost his honor. They cut his head off. They took his headless body, and they hanged it in the wall of the Philistines' idols of their God to give victory to their false gods. What a, what a, that, that's, that's, that is so shameful for God's people. What an embarrassment for the people of Israel who had the, 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 the living God, the all-powerful God, because of Saul. He lost his honor. That was a horrible thing to happen to the king of Israel. His head was cut off. His body was nailed to the wall of Bashan. But there's only a little bright spot that we see in this chapter and I spoke that about last Wednesday. This is in verse 11 through 13 there. Look at it. And when the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead heard of that which the Philistine had done to Saul, and all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the wall of Bashan and came to Jabez and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree of Jabez and fasted seven days. So this is only the real bright spot that I see here. These are valiant men that they took. They, instead of burying them, of their bodies that was already being desecrated, their bodies, the body was already mutilated. They burned them. And by the way, and I, I gave you that last Wednesday. We don't, we don't, we, this is not encouraging cremation. You could listen to the message on last Wednesday, okay? We don't believe that. We believe people were buried in the Bible. Amen? We believe that even Jesus himself is our example. Jesus was not burned. He was buried. Amen? They did that. This was not common. This was not common for them to do that with their death and their culture. They did it to, to prevent any further abuse of their bodies by the Philistine. These bodies of Saul, of Saul and his sons were given, and then in verse 13, they were given a, a decent animal burial instead of being allowed to hang and rot in disgrace in that wall where they nailed them. But let me just finish with this. In closing, I want to give you three important closing lessons, and I finish with this. Just to, in closing, I want to give you three important closing lessons. Number one, sin is serious. Sin is serious. You cannot look at the sad ending of Saul's life without reminding ourselves of the seriousness of sin. Don't you ever underestimate the power of sin. Don't you ever underestimate it. Saul's sin started small. 
It started very small and very subtle. The little sins of pride. And then the disobedience. And then his sins grew more and more. And then now we see him going to a witch. The witch will end there at night time, communicating with the dead. Then we see him in our chapter committing suicide. Sins start small when you don't detect it, and, and, and um, it'll get bigger like snowball. Don't take sin lightly. You better deal with your sin. Amen? I mean, I, I, we, we, are easy, we are easy about sin. We take sin lightly. We deliberately sin against God, and we say God will forgive. Well, yeah, he forgave, but the Bible said that should not tempt the Lord thy God. That's why Saul did. He tempted God. You can't have this attitude, well, you know what? I'm going to do it anyhow because God is compassionate and God is forgiving. Yes, he is. But don't forget, there's consequences of sin. And don't forget, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You and I need to treat sin like a snake that will destroy you. Only fools make mock of sin. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 9, oh, uh, fools make mock of sin. Only people who are fools play and toy with sin and expect to get by with it. I wish that we could see sin like God sees it, very serious. And we could remind ourselves that it was sin that put Jesus on the cross. It is sin that separates us from God, Christian. It is sin that robs us from his blessings, even our saved people. It is sin that will cause us to not get our prayers answered. According to Psalm 66 and verse 18, the Bible said that if I, regard, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So we got to take sin serious. Saul made excuses for his sin. He blamed everybody else. He blamed Samuel. He blamed David. He blamed his son Jonathan. He blamed everybody else except himself. He blamed the people. Look, if you are here tonight and you're making excuses for your sin, you're taking sin lightly. You're heading the wrong path. May God help us see tonight clearly the seriousness of sin. So, number one, sin is serious. Number two, spiritual decline is gra gradual. Spiritual decline is gradual. Saul had a humble beginning, but soon pride came in, and pride led to his envy, and then it led to hatred. You know, and it went worse and worse. And look what he ended up. It's possible for our spiritual life to deteriorate without even us knowing it. Spiritual decline is gradual. It's so gradual that you, it could go undetected. Undetected. You don't pray. You're supposed to pray every day. You don't read your Bible. You don't commune with God. You start missing church services. You, you, you start to drift. And then you're going to find yourself far away from God. You don't even know it. You know why? Because spiritual decline is gradual. That's what happened to Saul. And number three, obedience is the key of victory and success. Obedience is the key of victory and success. God made it clear to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 18, because thou obeys not the voice of the Lord. Made it clear in the beginning. That's why he, he faced the consequences and he went downhill and he made a mess of his life because it all started when he did not obey the voice of God. Pride and disobedience. You better stay away from those two. You better hate those two sins. Amen? Husbands, obey God's word. Wives, obey God's word. Children, obey God's word. Single people, obey God's word. Everybody, obey God's word. That's the key to victory. Look, God's will, how many of you want God's will for your life? You know what God's will is found? The Word of God. God's will, God's plan is found in the Word of God. Obey this book. Every known commandment, every message that you hear, every challenge, put it to practice. Obey God's Word. That's the key. God wants what is good for you. God doesn't want to mess you up. He didn't want to mess up, so he messed himself up. God does not want to mess you up. He wants to bless you. Disobedient to God's word will mess you up. It will mess me up. And that's why we need, I cannot overemphasize the importance of obeying God's word. I hit it last Sunday. I hit it today. I might hit it again with all these. I throw it in in my sermons. 
That's what we need. Amen. Joshua 1 a, This book of the law should not depart of the mouth. That should meditate day and night. Then, uh, uh, and, and observe to do everything that's written in it. Because then you're going to make your way prosperous and have good success. That's why, that's why, that's why give you good spiritual success in the battle that we are in. Let's stand on our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You heard the message clearly. I hope God spoke to your heart tonight. Saul's sad ending. We don't want to end up like Saul. We either, we all going to die one day. We either experience a happy death, putting the Lord first, obeying God's word, living for Christ, or a sad death like Saul of pride and disobedience. And it, by the way, you live that way, not only is it going to affect you, it's going to affect others, even your children. So what are we, we going to do about the message? Are we going to put it to practice or is it just a cute sermon? We need to put to practice what we heard tonight. The piano play, the invitation is open. We'd like to give the invitation. And the last of the sermon, if you need to pray, that's why we give the invitation so you come and pray and talk to God about what area he spoke to you tonight. Keep your heart sensitive. God wants to hear from you. Amen. God spoke to you, now he wants to hear from you. Amen. So that's why we give the invitation. You want to pray where you are? You want to come down here and kneel and pray? Do, it, it, it's, they're both good. 